Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for attending the uh, webinar today. So my name is Dan Haynes. Um, I'm the Director of Computer Forensics here at Vincent's Chartered Accounts. Um, today's topic, uh, Computer Forensics, Tracing Theft of Electronic Intellectual Property, and also we'll talk about some things you can do to, to try and protect uh, that sensitive uh, electronic intellectual property that you have. So moving along. What we're going to talk about today, um, basically an introduction, and I, I wanted to recognise that um, the people that are attending today uh, aren't going to be the ones that are actually perhaps uh, enforcing or tracing intellectual property theft themselves, but I think it's a, an important skill to have if you're talking to clients or if you're talking to staff or if you're talking to colleagues, to have those basic concepts under control, to think about some strategies that you can talk about, basic functions of what we do in computer forensics and, and the terms um, that we talk about when we're talking about computer forensics, which um, trying to demystify those certainly, how to protect the electronic files and some case studies um, that I'm aware of, certainly from my uh, direct experience as well. So um, hopefully everyone has joined us now and uh, we, can, we can get started. So what strikes me in dealing with these types of matters very often is that the value of this type of electronically stored information, uh, which some people may not think of as being their intellectual property, but um, it certainly is. And, and the value to most businesses or any business is extremely high. Um, certainly a sales-based business where that customer database or those, those pricing lists, although they're shared freely uh, within a business, for example, um, if that information were to leave the business, then it, it can be extremely damaging, especially where that type of information is in the hands of a competitor, for example. And often businesses, they're just not aware of how vulnerable they are until an instance of electronic theft actually occurs. So business is, of course, necessarily based upon trust and, and we trust our colleagues and our staff, you know, our employees, uh, sometimes those are family members with uh, our electronic information. And, and that has to be the case for the business to uh, run well and, and be a functioning business. Um, but that works very well when we're all friends, but sometimes in worst case scenarios, things can break down. And if that type of electronic information or sensitive intellectual property leaves the business, um, then it's very difficult to get the genie back in the bottle. Um, but there are some steps you can take to prevent that. And there are some professionals out there that can assist you if, if that has happened. So my role, um, and this is this is probably a fairly standard um, type of slide that I would present in a, in a webinar like this. So defining computer forensics has been the same for a very long time. Uh, the process of identifying, preserving, analyzing and presenting digital evidence in a manner that's legally acceptable in any judicial or administrative hearing. So when these types of matters are handed over to uh, the local IT person or a consultant or a family member or sometimes a person that might be good at computers that you know, um, you tend to be destroying or at least not preserving that important electronic evidence. And that's the cornerstone really uh, of what I do in terms of it being a computer forensic person is making sure that if there is evidence that assists us in a, in a case or litigation or even in a mediation type matter uh, where we've suffered a loss, if you can uh, reliably preserve the evidence of that offence occurring, then you're a long way along to winning that case and preserving your position. So um, that forensic image, uh, the term that you might have heard um, computer forensic people talk about is really the cornerstone of what we do. So we identify the electronic information, we preserve it by in 99.9% .9 of cases, taking what we call a forensic image. And I'll, I'll define that uh, as we move through the webinar but uh, that's the cornerstone, analysing it um, in a way that's efficient uh, and then presenting that information so that it can be understood by um, lay, lay people in a court, uh, other professionals, other experts, and certainly uh, any other side in a legal matter. Um, and that in a nutshell 
is, is what we do in terms of computer forensics and, and expertise, independent expertise. So what is electronic intellectual property? So you'll hear it referred to simply as IP or electronic IP, um, intellectual property. It's a category of property that includes intangible creations, uh, primarily copyrights, patents, trademarks, designs, um, documents, templates, uh, drawings, um, and a right such as a trade secret. Um, other works like music literature, that's intellectual property, some scientific discoveries, um, certainly in the realm of DNA and, and, and medicine, have now been uh, classified as uh, intellectual property. Uh, inventions, words, symbols, designs, we're all familiar with those. But the intangible nature of intellectual property presents difficulties when compared with traditional property like land or goods. So there's, there tends to not be a silo that we can access and we empty out our intellectual property and transfer it somewhere else. Um, when we consume intellectual property, it's, it's indivisible. So we can um, license intellectual property, we can um, provide uh, our expertise in applying that intellectual property without it really being depleted. So it's important to preserve um, what that intellectual property is and the rights to that intellectual property should be guarded. Um, otherwise, the value of it certainly decreases and your value accordingly. When we're looking at evidence in terms of intellectual uh, property theft, we're not often just looking at a computer. We can assess a network. We can look at the security risks of a network. Uh, we can um, image something like a server and see who has logged in and access those types of files. Um, often those servers exist in the cloud or on the internet in, in cloud types of services. And that's certainly becoming a lot more prevalent these days. Um, communication devices, so mobile phones are a big part of what we do now. They're often simply just small personal computers um, and they store information, they store images, they store location information, all of which we can identify and preserve and present uh, to a court should it be required. Uh, consumer electronics, so photocopiers can be important sources of information. A lot of photocopiers now have uh, what we call a, you know, a digital hard drive within them. They store the print jobs um, so that people can access them later or where you need to resize a print job or, or change something or lighten it or darken it. Those print jobs are actually stored on a hard drive on the photocopier. It's a digital photocopier. And we've had cases where we've actually imaged the hard drive on the photocopier and shown that records were being accessed without authority and being able to provide that evidence to a business owner is, is important. Now, personal storage devices, um, the use of USBs is very prevalent. USBs are extremely cheap. They're inexpensive. They're very large. Um, the average size of a USB drive now is probably three or four times larger than the average size of hard drives on a, on a computer itself. So there's huge amounts of information that are very portable and can be accessed very easily on almost any device once it leaves its native system. So that's important to, to realize that. So what can we do? Let's understand what we're doing when we're recovering information. So a file system on a computer is simply a method of storing and retrieving data. Uh, apart from the storage system itself, you'll have a file index or, or, a, or a table where um, a software or an operating system can uh, quickly access and find out where that data is stored. So it's a central type of directory. I directory. often use the analogy that a library will always have an index or a card catalog or a computer that's used to tell you where the books are. So it gives you the name of the book, um, for example, uh, where it is in the library, it's, its call number, for example, so that you can immediately go to that shelf and get the book. You don't have to look at every single book in the library. And that's what the index table on a computer is. It might be a, um, a central directory. So what we can see here is, is a simple analogy of a, a computer hard drive. Very, very, very simple. Um, what, we've, what we can see is that the allocation index table here is one, file two, and file three. Now, the information in the file index will be that file one exists at, uh, in our very simple example here, 
uh, it will exist at row two, it will be three blocks long, uh, it's blue in colour for example, so all that information will be stored here in the file index table. Um, and the file itself is, is obviously you can see below. Now, this is a very simple example, obviously not to scale, and files are never stored uh, in nice neat rows like this. But just for this simple example, let's, let's assume that that's true. So that what these are active files, so they are simply sitting on the hard drive, they can be accessed by the computer. What happens when we delete something? Um, it's not the case that the computer um, goes to the hard drive, deletes the file, um, ensures that it's all gone, shaves it all out, removes everything around so that it's all in the nice rows. It's just not the case. It's a random access system. So what we want out of a computer really is speed. Um, and to get that speed, all that happens is that an adjustment is made in the file index to show that that file is deleted, a little tick or a little flag. Um, and then that space on the hard drive is available to the computer to write to if it's needed. That's a, that's a simple example. So if we look back at our uh, first example again, we can see that uh, file two here has been grayed out um, and the file itself is deleted, but it still exists on the hard drive. And if someone like me were to take a photograph or a forensic image of that hard drive and apply some specialist software to recover those deleted files, then you can see it's a relatively simple process to do that. And that's a basic file recovery process. Uh, so we're able to do that. Um, in extreme cases, perhaps if it's a small device in capacity or if a lot of time has passed between file being deleted and the file being analyzed, you can see what's happened here is that file four has overwritten file two and it's no longer there. Although we have an entry in the index so that we know that file two did exist and it was in this position on the hard drive and it was so many blocks long and um, the nature of the file, the properties of the file, the file itself can't be recovered, it's physically gone. Although if you were to have a backup or um, a recover point, a restore point on that system, then you certainly may be able to retrieve it, but conventionally we call that file being overwritten. And that's the main process. So if I just move on there. And when, to, when we're talking about files, Another concept to remember is that information production today involves perfect copies. So it's not in an analog sense, if you were to copy a file, a degradation of that file each time, we're talking about perfect copies. So it just adds to the portability and the transferability of information, especially where it's electronic. And if it's sensitive, then it's not going to degrade over time. It can be consumed constantly. So if I come now to the concept of a forensic image, conventionally we might be used to a file copy or a right click, copy paste or, or dragging files to an external device. Um, and that gives you what we call a logical copy of a file or an active data file. Um, that is not really a reliable uh, or admissible copy of evidence. So because that data might have been changed in the transfer process, um, even though it's relatively fast to copy and paste a file, um, it's open to alteration and it's not verifiable that that uh, file is exactly the same in terms of the metadata of the file as the one that we had before. When we take a forensic image, it's an exact copy of all the data from that device, hard drive, phone uh, or a USB, right down to the dates that are on the file everything that's um, deleted, not deleted, um, everything that's in terms of the operating system that's being used to operate that disk, we capture all of that information at the same time. So it's a once and for all uh, snapshot, if you like, of everything on that device. So it's, it's the most in-depth and verifiable process that we have, and it's called a forensic image. So it it's, real, it's certainly much slower than copying a file, but it gives you that flexibility for in-depth analysis. It gives you a read-only, what we call a read-only forensic image, 
Um, it's very portable, meaning that we can provide that image to the court or to another expert to also provide analysis that we need. It's verifiable and it's secure. And that's the cornerstone of, of computer forensic type work. Now I mentioned metadata as well. Um, and some of you may not be familiar with the term metadata. It simply means the data about the data. So if we're thinking of, a, for example, a Word document, uh, the text of the document that you see on the screen, you might think of as being the data. Um, there are other things about that file, such as what date it was last edited or printed, when it was last saved, who the last person that changed the document was. And we can glean all that information uh, much more reliably when we have that forensic image. And you'll hear, um, IT people uh, often talk about what metadata is, the metadata about a file. And if we capture that in a forensic image, it means that we can search or find files from their metadata. So if I have a complaint or an allegation that something occurred on a certain date, uh, if I have a forensic image, I can filter the information by that date. Things that were all deleted on a certain date or created on a certain date by a certain person, at a certain location, we can we can filter the files out for all of those types of properties. So it's a it's a really a, a very efficient and superior method of of accessing data. So that's always the best way to go. And if you have an expert in court who hasn't done a forensic image or hasn't heard one, uh, then you might be in trouble uh, in terms of a court case. But moving on. All right. Um, the best thing to do would be to show you um, how this might operate. And if I can flick over to a video that we have in this regard of a what is a very simple data acquisition. So we've all seen a voice recorder, a digital voice recorder, one of those digital ones that um, you can pull out, it becomes a USB and you can uh, play it on a computer. So what you're seeing on screen now is if you place that USB in your computer, you get folders of digital recordings, folder A, B, C, D, E, um, and they comprise, there are active uh, voice recordings there those Windows Media files. Folder B has nothing in it, C, um, D, and E. There's nothing in those folders, simply the Olympus um, operating system. If I apply that US or that voice recorder to my forensic software, and we look at it in that software, you see the same media files in folder A. However, in folder D, we have four deleted files. Um, they weren't uh, obvious or they weren't available to us just by plugging it into Windows. What I can do now is if they're deleted files, I can export them out of the system, essentially uh, making them available. And that's not coming up too well on the screen. Apologies for that. But we can export those files out of the system and make them available as regular. Un they've now been undeleted voice recordings um, and they weren't available before. So this was a case where we had some aspects of a um, court case were in dispute in terms of shareholders meetings and we were able to retrieve those voice recordings in, and just, um, provide them to the court to further the position of uh, one of the parties. So that's a very simple recovery. Now in practice, talking about comparing different files. So how do we know if two files um, are the same or that a file is complete in terms of the records that we have from evidence and the records that we are looking at in court. And that's, we would often compare the signature of a file. So the digital signature of a file or a hard drive is how we do it. Now, those signatures are called hashes. The most common method um, is an MD5 hash. Uh, it's probably the most well known. Uh, it's very reliable, although there are some theoretical differences. There are other methodologies, but this is certainly the one that we use. Um, the reliability given by um, fingerprinting a digital file is that there is no chance that two files created on two separate computers can be identical. And that we, if we have a file that has the same signature on this computer as exists on this other computer that we have, then there's really um, only one reliable method that that can have occurred and that is being from the source. So that's how we verify that files uh, are identical and inferring that they have been removed without authority by comparing their fingerprints or their hashes. Now these two files, the text of one file and the text of file number two. So the quick fox jumps over the lazy brown dog full stop in file one. 
Tex Walt, who has the quick fox, jumps over the lazy brown dog, comma. Now, you would think that if we're fingerprinting those two files, that they would have a similar fingerprint. But in fact, a computer or the hashing algorithm sees those two files as being completely different, completely different as evidenced by below the hash of the file. So the hash is there for file number one or its fingerprint. The fingerprint for the second file is also below. You can see it's a it's a 32 alphanumeric code. That's the fingerprint of the file. They're not even remotely alike. So uh, that's how we know that the two files are different. They have a different fingerprint. And it's useful in terms of identifying identical files and different files. So in terms of computer forensics, we get recovery of deleted files. We're preserving metadata, activity logs, passwords. Um, data is read-only, portable and verifiable. We can filter by the metadata. Um, and it's fully admissible in terms of a court environment. So that's where the computer forensics comes in. And it's, it's a very useful process for our clients. Um, we're preserving that metadata. We can search the data more efficiently. We can use targeted searching. So the last modified date, who the author was or deleted files. Deleted and fragmented data is also captured. So sometimes we want to have partial recovery of images or, or, or drawings. And we can search for duplicates and we can search for files that are similar by the contents of the files by their text. Now, generally we're involved in terms of intellectual property theft in three main categories. So theft by email, which is where most data theft was happening perhaps 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. If there was some sensitive intellectual property or some valuable intellectual property like a, a stock list or some CAD drawings or some legal precedent documents or contracts um, then or a mild file, often that was um, emailed to the person's home address. They would then go home, download the file to their home computer, return to work the next day, delete the email and then um, that would be an, instant, an instance of, of data theft by email. That went away for a long time when it was became apparent that we could trace that very easily, especially where the, um, the client would be using an exchange type setup with, with Microsoft Exchange or a centralized system uh, where emails aren't deleted or easily deleted. They're certainly backed up. Um, it's making a return now due to webmail. So where, for example, a staff member or colleague might have access to webmail uh, at their workplace then they're emailing those types of stock codes or price lists out to home or to a competitor. Uh, and that's much more difficult to trace on a system without really forensic uh, specialist tools. So we're seeing a return of email now. So um, that, that uh, restriction on webmails, um, or at least being aware of this type of instance is, is very important. Now, personal data, excuse me, personal data storage, We're also seeing a lot of this type of instance of uh, loss where businesses have lost entire client databases on US, USB disks that simply walk out the front door or in their um, staff pockets because their IP is not protected. Now we're able to pick this up um, relatively easily as well because the use of those USBs, um, we're relying on the fact that um, there are traces left on the system in terms of the files that were accessed on that USB, um, the naming of files being identifiable, and records and serial numbers of that USB are actually stored on um, the source computer. So we, can, we know that USB, uh, we can identify the brand and the serial number of the USB has been applied to that computer. Um, in most cases, we can see the files that have been accessed on that USB, and that forms the basis of a report that might uh, go to court in terms of theft of intellectual property. Um, it's important though, and we'll come to prevention soon, that we have a defendable position in terms of what information were we allowed to access on USB? Do we Are we aware of the names of our sensitive intellectual property? And what were the dates that these types of things occurred? So the defense might be that, oh, I was allowed to take files to use at home. So a policy in this type of instance is extremely important, which I'll come to soon. Now, the third um, area that we're seeing a lot of these days are theft of intellectual property on cloud or data sharing apps. 
which they are extremely easy to use, they're very easy to install, um, and they do present difficulties in terms of tracing what's been taken, especially where the app is uninstalled by the user prior to them exiting the business. So um, you get a case where you really have to do some deep forensic analysis similar to what we saw earlier with that voice recorder and recover deleted folders and files. So it's not um, really easy to trace if you had um, a basic level of, of computer knowledge. So our forensic analysis, we can often identify what was installed um, where on the staff workstation. There are usually traces of files depending on how recently we're called in to investigate. Um, but the actual level of data that's shared across these applications is, is almost impossible to trace. So once it leaves the business, we can't easily identify where that IP has gone to. So if you have an instance of Dropbox and those files leave the business, um, they can be easily shareable over the web by that application and we've completely lost control. So it's something that uh, does present a big problem for our clients. So um, it needs to be the subject of some serious prevention. So how can we protect in terms of personal data and then business data? So um, at a basic level, staff phones, staff computers should have protection. So they should have a, a pin code on every phone or a passcode on every phone and a password on every a laptop that's given to staff. Staff should be educated to be alert for suspicious email attachments or links to infected websites that might be looking to leach out your files or take control of a system. Don't open an email that you're not 100% certain of the source and keep your operating systems and your antivirus software up to date. And if there are uh, patches that come out, make sure they're, they're patched and up to date. Make sure the passwords are complex and use a different password for as many different things as you can. And that limits a breach to that one device. And that's that's as important as using a complex password is don't reuse that complex password anywhere else. Use a password manager application. I've been recommending these for a long time. They're starting to get into the mainstream now. Um, certainly um, ask staff to have different passwords for various devices. Don't keep the password for your server or your remote login just in a text file that you have in a note somewhere. Make sure it's secure. Um, a password manager, they're very good. Um, they're often inexpensive compared to the value of the IP they protect. Um, they generate complex passwords for you or they'll simply store your password in, a, in an encrypted state so it can't be accessed, can't be hacked. Um, and the only password that you'll then need to remember is the one for the actual application. Hence, uh, you need one good password for the application. It then stores everything else for you and it can often even log into a website for you um, if you're accessing on a device. Take advantage of two-factor authentication. Now, a lot of people shy away from this. Um, years ago, it was a much more cumbersome process with tokens. You had to keep a token with you. Um, they often ran out of battery or they weren't available um, and you needed a password as well as a token and, and various things. But it works a lot better now with the use of mobile devices. So if you enable two-factor authentication, and everybody should do this, a code will be generated um, by the app on your phone or you will be sent a code that you need to enter in when you log in. Now, the, the beauty of this is that if someone's trying to, someone has acquired your password and they're trying to access your banking or your business banking, for example, remotely from a different country, then that code will be sent to your mobile locally and if the code isn't entered they can't access it at all so even if they have your password they won't be able to log in so it's a really strong uh, method of preventing uh, unauthorized access so it's something we recommend very highly it's very easy to do it sounds complicated but it's not the first time you log in with two-factor authentication you'll have to input a code after that um, the website will know that it's a location, sorry, it's a login from the same location and it won't ask you for a code every time. But if you log in from a different device or a different computer, different location, it simply asks you for a code again. So it's very easy, as long as you have your cell phone secured. Now, in, turn, in a corporate sense, um, we have a big problem now with these cloud sharing apps. Um, so on the left, we have um, 
perhaps a staff member or a colleague who uses um, a cloud sharing app, so Google Drive or Dropbox or something similar uh, to access um, company information, perhaps if they work remotely or if they work uh, in a sales basis uh, out of the office, they can call up files on a computer. But as you can see here, sensitive data isn't just uh, synchronized with their home computer or their work phone or their office computer. It could be other devices like a tablet, any other computer that they log into will sh then share that data across the internet. So you have the case where um, even though the information is only supposed to be on their home computer, if they log in somewhere else, then your sensitive data becomes their cloud data. It's then shared with a separate office computer, a separate mobile phone, or it could be sent to any type of uh, other digital device uh, out of our control. And this is what we're talking about over here on the right-hand side of the slide. Genie's out of the bottle. We don't know where that information is going after it leaves us. And it really is, in some cases, it really is too late. And you lose control of what was your sensitive data. Difficult to regulate, difficult to control. Um, they are so prevalent now um, in business. So what can you do? Well, um, you need to invest in some prevention, get some protection over your files as well. Um, if you do suspect an instance of, of theft of intellectual property, then don't be afraid to consider professional, professional assistance and get some enforcement, get some recovery, um, try and get that genie back in the bottle if you can. So in terms of prevention, that's the takeaway message from today. Be aware of what your sensitive intellectual property is. Have a think about what your business relies upon in terms of is it um, the format of your documents? Is it some designs? Is it your legal precedent documents? Um, is it your contracts? Where are they? Are they protected? Um, identify the risks. That's a huge step in prevention. And we can't, uh, I can't recommend that highly enough, that when these things do happen, um, sometimes clients might say to me, oh, I'm not sure what they would have taken, but we think it might have been some files or some contracts or the format of our invoices or our CAD designs. We're not sure. It could be an Excel file. We don't know. So be ahead of the game and understand the risk of your business and what and where your intellectual property is electronically stored. Um, so actually retrieving sensitive stolen data is next to impossible, as I said, but those cloud sharing apps, but um, the cliche of prevention being worth an ounce of cure is completely applicable here. You may not ever need to call an expert in if your uh, files are protected and you're aware of, of what they are and where they are, and people should never have access or be allowed to process those files in an external environment by using Dropbox or by using Google Drive or on a USB. It should be protected. Um, spend some time on constructing and enforcing a strong IT data policy. Now that's easy to say, um, and it might be implied, there might be duties of all employees not to share this type of information, but as we know, um, there's always one bad apple that might spoil the bunch. So um, get a strong IT data policy that works for your business model and your requirements. So it might be that some data has to exist on USBs if those staff work out of the office or they work on the road, but those USBs should be controlled by you. So think of if they were to be lost, what would you lose? So files on those USBs should be encrypted so that you need a password even to just open the file. You should, they should be fingerprinted so that you know the hash of the files that you lost and you should be aware of what format they're in. So that's very important. Educate all your employees to make them aware of the policy that if they're not allowed to have sensitive files on their personal USBs or files should never be moved into Dropbox that's not the corporate Dropbox account, not their personal one, um, then they've immediately breached their employee duties and they'll be liable for sanction. So in 99.9% .9 of cases, uh, the human is the weak link in a computer network. I could build you the strongest, most secure network uh, in the world, but no one would want to work for you because there'd be no USBs, there'd be no cloud sharing apps, there'd be no Facebook, all those types of things um, that staff now want to have access to um, need to be limited. So have a strong data policy that says 
everything is encrypted. If it's going to leave this office, it has to be on the corporate Dropbox account. You can't merely be putting things in your personal account. And if things are lost, the company needs to be made aware straight away. So simple controls are often the best. Other things to consider, have strong passwords, as I said earlier. Restrict access to important data only to those who need it. Don't leave files out in the open, especially where it's something that your business might rely upon. Place controls on files, making them read only. They can't be altered. Um, so someone can't say, oh no, that's, that's my uh, legal precedent document, or that's my CAD drawing, um, it's got my signature on it. Um, make files read only as much as you can. PDFs can be made much stronger by putting security restrictions on them. Restrictions over printing, restrictions over saving, restrictions over editing or moving the file, they're all available within uh, PDF documents and, and many, many documents. Security settings are there for your protection, you should use them. Um, so again, completely removing staff access to USBs or to cloud apps is entirely possible, but it might make a network difficult to use and, and uh, staff spending more time transferring files, less, less profit. So get that policy in place, get an understanding of your risks and do it today. It's very important. Um, the next level would be to invest in application monitoring for sensitive information. Application monitoring means that the application that the file uh, cre is created on, or you might have a document management system that tells you who was the last person to access a file and where they saved it to on the network. Um, and it tracks all of those types of uh, movements of a file within your network. So um, should something bad happen where files go missing or an acrimonious staff departure, you know what files they have in fact saved down to a USB or placed into a, a Dropbox account because the, there's application monitoring in place. Um, where possible, we tell our clients to resist bring your own device situations. Now that's the case, especially with phones, especially with tablets and computers. Um, if, if a file has been um, stolen, emailed or, or, or put on a USB, letting the staff member take that device with them would completely stymie any meaningful investigation. So um, there's been cases where we would have had strong evidence on a, on a cell phone, um, but the cell phone is no longer under our control that they allow the staff member to take it with them. So we lose SMS information, email information, um, those types of things. So Devices should remain in your control, of course. If you suspect an acrimonious, or if you have an acrimonious um, departure with a member of staff, secure their staff workstation and their phone and whatever else you can find and have them properly imaged. Even if nothing bad happens and you don't require that information, it's essentially insurance against future loss. But if you need to do an investigation later on, you've already imaged their computer and you can see what files they were clicking on the week or the two weeks before they left. You can see what they're emailing, you can see what USBs they had and what they're accessing on those files. And it gives you a better understanding, perhaps even peace of mind that nothing did happen uh, later down the track. Um, it's, it's something that we have clients doing, not every computer, but if there's a, a bad departure or someone was suspected of, of illicit activity, then it's, it's insurance against something that happens in the future. And we ask our clients to consider that very strongly. Um, if you think you've suffered a loss as a result of theft of data or a similar action um, or staff harassment or, or any, anything like that, resist the urge to try and investigate it yourself beyond normal bounds. So if you're on the uh, person's computer, for example, double clicking on files or, or running um, a retail piece of software that you found on the web, um, that could alter important, important evidence that we need to rely on later on. Um, we call it stomping over the evidence. So just be careful that you're not opening files that they would have opened. And so those types of metadata um, are being destroyed by you. Remember that you've already put a policy and you've put some controls in place about what files can and can't be accessed. So if any record is found of a client, of a, a big part a staff member breaching those controls, you've immediately got an, an enforceable action that you can, you can take steps against that former employee to recover, either recover that information or have them disclose what information was taken and make them aware that they were in breach of, of the policy. So that's very important. Um, securing ex-employee data, which we discussed earlier, can be the difference when an action is necessary. Um, and it's important to make a decision on that enforcement sooner. 
So rather than thinking, oh, perhaps we should have done this or we should have taken these steps, you've already taken them. You can assess what the risk was, what, they, what information might have left your business and make a decision. So with that in mind, uh, hopefully that information was useful. Uh, thank you everyone for logging on. We've had a good audience today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at Vincent's. My name's Dan Haynes, and thanks again for your attention. Have a good day.